Think Forward. Think Research Channel. Welcome everybody to the 15th annual Birken Road Symposium. As many of you know, this is the flagship event for the Birken Road Institute, this symposium. And it is the 15th event, and it is sort of our re-inauguration since Katrina. So we're very, very excited to have this event today and to have all of you here and to have our speakers. Now first and foremost, I would like to thank Mr. Aaron and Peggy Selber of the Birken Road family for their tremendous support for the A.B. Freeman School of Business, for funding the Birken Road Institute since 1990 and taking care of us and, and really having the vision for this. Mr. Selber, please stand up. Give him a big hand. Um, today's theme and event, as you know, is Critical Moments in Leadership, Changing the Rules of the Game. And if you think about critical moments in organizations, these are key decisions, momentum events in organizations that have the potential to change an organization for better or for worse. These critical junctures in organizations can be ignored, they can be recognized and acted upon, but they exist whether we ignore them or not, and organizations thrive after them, they wither, and sometimes they even die. Now today, our distinguished panelists each bring phenomenal expertise. Um, this, this is just an amazing panel. They have very different perspectives. Holly Gregory is a partner in Weil, Gottschall, and Manges, and she counsels CEOs, board of directors, executives in ethics and governance and how to not have a crisis critical moment. Bill Carey, our author, former naval pilot and CEO and founder of Tennessee History for Kids, um, is with us today. Frank Stewart, while we advertised him as Emeritus Chairman of the Board of Stewart Enterprises, he's Chairman again. Obviously, he, you know, he's still staying very active. He's fabulous. He's got this wonderful organization. Um, he makes a difference every day in the death care business. And Sam Mock, Managing Member of Condor International Advisors, and he was former CFO of the Labor Department um, from 2001 to 2007. And I have to be really honest, after having dinner with him last night, I think he's lived 200 years because he has done so many things. And each of these speakers just have tremendous um, resumes. And I just wanted to highlight their key moments. Um, each of these speakers is extraordinary in his and her own right. And as I said, they bring valuable expertise in sharing this with us and helping us understand critical moments in leadership. But I think together they represent a phenomenal kaleidoscope of perspectives. Um, and that's why they are here today. And I would like to end with a quote um, from Thucydides. And I think it sort of captures the moment of our event today. The bravest are surely those who have the clearest vision of what is before them, glory and danger alike. Yet notwithstanding, go out and meet it. So I give the floor to Ms. Gregory. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. I'm very pleased to be here today. In the past seven years, we've seen an unprecedented number of companies that have had to restate their financials after discovering irregularities in their accounts. And in many instances, the problem was um, inadvertent in nature due to, you know, mistakes and poor internal controls. But for a significant number of companies, including some companies that I've been working with, the problems related to intentional manipulation of financial reporting, 
um, in the form of inappropriate use of special purpose entities to move liabilities off the books, or irregularities in revenue recognition. I don't know if you've heard about the 35-day month at Computer Associates, um, or the intentional backdating of stock options. And unfortunately, in many of these cases, the CEO or the CFO or the general counsel or even all three were implicated in the wrongdoing. And I think a pattern is apparent when you look at these companies. Often the companies were led by a very charismatic leader, an imperial CEO, if you will, with a relatively weak or passive or ineffective board of directors, who often surrounded in the senior executive ranks by people who were less, far less experienced than one might see in a public company at that level. Um, these CEOs tended to lead by creating sort of an entrepreneurial culture on steroids, if you will, with an unusual focus on and significant pressures for um, meeting and beating the numbers and an incentive culture that really, really um, paid for results and punished for a lack of results. And in this culture, related party transactions and self-dealing was often accepted as business as usual. Um, these were entities where success was highly rewarded, loyalty was highly rewarded in, inside the companies, and criticism and challenge was often punished. Um, and therefore, frequently you saw a culture of acquiescence develop. And apparently many of the CEOs took uh, Mark Twain seriously when he said that the secret of success is honesty and fair dealing, and if you can fake these, you've got it made. Well. I have to ask for a minute for your forbearance. I need to make a disclaimer. Um, in counseling corporate clients on very sensitive issues of corporate governance, I'm bound by ethical duties that make it um, inappropriate for me to talk about specific advice that I've given in situations. I'm bound by an ethical duty to keep my advice and conversations with clients confidential. So I won't be talking in detail about specific issues that I've worked worked in at specific companies, but I want you to know that the views that I'm going to share with you are based on a composite of experience. Now there's no doubt that um, in reaction to some very real failures of ethics and leadership and governance we've seen over the last couple of years, that the rules of corporate governance have really changed. Now this isn't a change in direction so much, I think, as a bringing to life the accountability paradigm that was always intended in governance managers who were really held accountable to boards of directors and boards of directors who were really accountable to the shareholders, the owners of the company. And from my perspective, um, the change has been very beneficial and I think it was really needed, although it hasn't been without pain and cost and certainly discomfort for directors and managers who now really operate in a fishbowl in which every one of their actions or inactions is subject to considerable scrutiny. And I'm talking here mostly about public company directors. Um, a recurring theme in corporate governance that's been highlighted by many of these corporate crises is the need for the board to continually ensure that it has the best managers appropriate running the company. And when I say best, I mean both best in terms of performance, but also best in terms of leadership and ethics. And specifically, a theme in governance is ensuring that neither the board nor management becomes unduly entrenched. There needs to be contestability. And this means that no CEO or board should continue to serve if they're not performing well. Now, of course, the devil's in the details, and we can argue about over what time period do you look at performance, and we can debate what are the appropriate measures of performance, but I'm going to leave that for another day. Um, I wanted to focus today on one extraordinary leadership issue that I've counseled clients on in a host of different um, situations. And it's the question of when is it time for the leader or the leaders to go? When is it time to exit? I think of this as the George Washington moment for CEOs and more particularly for boards. You'll of course recall that in I think 1796, Washington really stood his ground and adamantly refused to stand for a third term in office just as he had refused to accept the trappings of power associated with monarchy. He was really my model of the anti-entrenchment executive. 
Now, the issue about when is it time for the leader to go comes up in a whole host of diverse situations. In very normal times, there's the issue of succession planning. Even when things aren't going wrong, an organization needs to have a sense of who will be the next leaders, or where might the next leaders come from, and how do we develop them? And I, in counseling around this issue, it can be difficult, because this is, it's a very, you know, CEOs are very human, and this is kind of like the same reason none of us do all we can around estate planning. It's hard to think about the time when we're no longer needed or we will no longer be in a position. And so counseling boards to focus on succession issues is relatively straightforward these days. Um, do a little prodding, remind of a duty of care as fiduciaries owed to the organization and how that means they really need to think in the long run about how the company's developing and who is going to be well positioned to take over and how can we develop those current leaders. And potentially if we had to go outside of the organization in an emergency, where might we look? By the way, I, I would say that one of the signs of a truly enlightened CEO these days is one who actually pushes his or her board to think about succession issues in the long run. Now, of course, CEO succession planning becomes a little bit easier in some ways, less pleasant but easier when there's been a really poor performance or malfeasance by the CEO. And these days we see boards taking fairly quick action when the CEO has gotten into trouble somehow. There's no longer a lot of patience or willingness in the current environment to hang on to CEOs who don't perform or especially if they've engaged in some form of wrongdoing. Now these extraordinary and at times painful decisions are made by directors who come to understand that the best interest of the corporation is the paramount value and has to take precedence over their own individual interest in continuing on the board and seeing things through. And they can do that. They can do that. I think about um, how these decisions are never easy and they're never lightly made and they usually evolve over a period of time when the CEO and often the CFO and often the general counsel have been fired and an investigation is underway and there are lawsuits and regulatory action um, and a new CEO or a new board member have come into the situation and is helping to push for this kind of change. Thinking about how I counsel in these situations, I think my approach has been to provide in part not only a legal understanding of the situation, but also a realistic perspective in providing information to the board about their own role and responsibilities, but also about the expectations and viewpoints of the regulators and the courts and the investors and the public at large to help the board understand the larger picture and pressures for and the pros and cons of change. But I, I wanted to take a minute to speak about, this was an interesting assignment that the professor um, gave me, to think about how my own values and biases and framework help to um, frame my approach to counseling clients on this kind of an issue. I begin with the notion that as a lawyer, I'm in a very special position of public trust. And as a corporate lawyer, I have a very special duty to my client, which is the corporation. And given this public trust and the fact that I'm hired to represent the corporation but have to deal directly with the individuals who've made the decision to hire me or my firm, I have to keep a very clear view of who my client is and where my own interests may conflict. I need to understand um, my own interests and my motivations and in particular, stay mindful of where my interests and motivations may conflict with the interests of my client so that I can con consciously disregard my own interests in providing my client with advice. Now, my own interests and motivations are fairly transparent and well understood. I want to be paid. Um, I want to keep the business. I want to get more business. And usually, that's in the client's interest because it means that I am available and responsive and I care about them and I'm on the job 24-7 and you can call me and reach me in the middle of the night and I'll drop what I'm doing and respond. However, in some of the most difficult situations that I have to counsel clients about, um, I often need to give advice to the clients that they may not want to hear. And so I also have to always be willing to go. I have to be willing to be fired. And I always keep that in mind when I'm counseling my clients. 
So I have my own issues about when is it time to go. I have to simply understand that frequently I'm the only one who's well positioned to tell it like it is. Now, the task force of the New York State Bar Association issued a report on the role of the lawyer in corporate governance, and I want to quote from it. They said, by rendering well-informed legal advice, even in the face of client pressures to the contrary, Lawyers can play their most productive role in avoiding future corporate scandals. The forthright rendition of such advice is every lawyer's duty. The professional courage necessary to press such advice, sometimes at the risk of losing a client or a job, is indispensable to a lawyer's ability to play effective role in corporate governance. This is the obligation I remind myself of whenever I'm facing a really tough situation. I want to share another bias with you. I believe that the vast majority of corporations, corporate directors, managers, employees, even lawyers, really try to do the right thing. And we usually succeed. The foundation for me for doing the right thing is really understanding roles and responsibilities. My own role, my own responsibility, but helping my clients understand their roles and responsibilities and interests and in particular, understanding where the tensions or competing interests might lie. And I'll add to that foundation a commitment to trying to find common ground or purpose and to then engaging in intentional dialogue around the ethics of a situation. Thank you. I'll give the floor to Mr. Carey. Uh, I live in Nashville, and I wrote a book about Tulane Hospital. And in case you're wondering what the hook to Nashville is, Tulane Hospital has got an interesting story. Um, it is not owned by Tulane University. It's owned, it's a privately owned hospital uh, that is owned by a Nashville-based company called HCA. Uh, we obviously were insulated. Uh, we mean those of us who live in Tennessee were insulated from what happened down here and I know that each of you has some degree of, of Katrina story that's a first person story. Um, uh, after it occurred and the dust had settled, we of course saw what, we, what, what garbage that there was on television and I did a book on what happened at Tulane at the hospital. Uh, and let me talk a little bit about this because it ended up being a very interesting story. Uh, now HCA had been through hurricanes before. HCA owns about 200 hospitals. Um, and they had been through hurricanes before in Florida. Um, but they had never been through anything quite like this. And in advance of, of, um, of Katrina, as they knew the storm was coming, they, the, the people at Tulane did a lot to get ready. They, they boarded up the hospital. They stocked up on food. They tried to check out everyone that they could. They went to a special shift of people, which they referred to as their A-team people who were specially trained for this type of work, and people who had taken care of their loved ones before and maybe didn't have a large family to bring with them. They created a command and control center, kind of like you would on a Navy ship. Um, they moved the emergency room of the hospital from the ground floor to the second floor, anticipating a flood, but not a permanent flood, kind of a, a flood that would come and go. They handed out the special satellite f cell phones, which were supposed to work. And, um, and then something I didn't realize until I interviewed, they opened up the arsenal. They had a lot of weaponry under lock and key at that hospital, uh, which is something um, that kind of surprised me. But I guess the more I learned about the situation, the more I understood it. Um, but just to give you an idea of what they prepared for in terms of electrical power, you, obviously you can't run a hospital without electricity. Um, and the first thing you need to know in a major storm is what's going to happen when the power goes out. Uh, it's not like if this room goes out, we can all just wander out. You have people die in a hospital if the power goes out. Um, Tulane HCA had several backups. The first was the auxiliary power, which is bolted to the basement floor of the hospital, uh, which is the way the hospital was built in the 70s. It works wonderfully, uh, but if the water rises to a certain level, it becomes useless. Uh, knowing this, uh, they thought a lot about it and sent into Tulane a large generator on a big tractor trailer. So this is about seven feet above the ground with enough gasoline to run for about 18, 20 hours, I believe it was. Um, the idea was that when, um, when the power went out uh, and, and if it flooded, this would be the second backup and they could operate this thing for about 
about 18 hours, I believe it was. Um, after that, theoretically, they could send more fuel down there. At least that's what they thought. And, um, and then, of course, beyond that, they had a few small generators that could operate and keep just life support systems going. Now, you may say, well, this sounds pretty logical. Well, let me tell you, um, not a lot of hospitals made these types of preparations. In fact, no, no other hospital in, the, in New Orleans made these types of preparations, and that wasn't obvious until, until it happened. Um, in addition to all these types of preparations, and far more important than that, honestly, was a spirit of resourcefulness and a general directive to the people at Tulane to do what needed to be done to run the hospital, and if necessary, to get people safely out of the hospital and in, and if, in, the, pro, and in the process to do the right thing regarding the general public, if at all humanly possible. Now, I want to emphasize that this directive was far more important than preparation. If they had done nothing to get ready, this would have saved them. And if they had done twice as much to get ready, but didn't have this general directive um, and this spirit, it wouldn't have worked. Um, and it might seem, well, that's, that's logical that that would happen. Well, that didn't happen in all the hospitals. For example, let me go over some of the things that went wrong. I told you that HCA and Tulane went to great lengths to put in these generators uh, and that they were um, um, prepared for kind of what happened in Florida, where a storm comes in and the place can't be um, reached for a day. Well, of course, that's not what happened. The storm came and went, and for about a about half a day, it looked like everything was going to be fine, and then the water started rising, and no one could explain why. Well, what eventually happened is, of course, the city flooded, and basically downtown New Orleans became a series of, of man-made islands called buildings. In some areas, you couldn't get from one to the other. Um, they couldn't get fuel to the hospital. All these plans that they had made to send in extra fuel, uh, they went to all this great length and, and got a truck, and it left Covington. And it went down the interstate and could not get into New Orleans. It could have made it to Tulane Hospital, uh, honestly, but it, it was the National Guard checkpoints. And at one point, the truck driver who I finally spoke with, who was hard to track down, I should tell you, um, said that he, would, that he finally reached a place where there were about 1,000 evacuees, a lot of them with weapons. And he decided he would then turn around, that it just, he wasn't going to make it. So the plan to operate electrical power from this generator beyond about 18 hours went away. If that truck had gotten through, Tulane Hospital never would have lost electrical power in spite of the flood. It's really amazing to think about it. Uh, to give you an idea of something else that they weren't really prepared for but had to improvise, Tulane Hospital does not, did not have a helicopter pad. Um, in previous occasions, they had used the Superdome when they needed to bring patients in and out. Well, Tulane doesn't have a, a helo pad. They do have a parking garage. And uh, as it turns out, um, there's a bridge on the second floor that takes you from the hospital to the parking garage, and that ended up being very important. Um, after the storm came through, the CEO of the hospital went out and stood on the roof of the parking garage and said, you know, the, these street lights, we don't need these anymore. And so they tied a, a chain to a back of a truck and yanked the street lights down and basically started flying helicopters on and off the uh, parking garage. Now, let me go over also some other things, and there's minor things, and I talk about them in the book, that all could have become huge had it not been simply for the spirit of innovation. Um, I mentioned that everyone was giving out the satellite phones. They didn't work. <clears throat> As it turns out, those phones don't work very well. They discovered this the hard way. They, won't, they have stopped buying them. Um, they pretty much had to stand at the edge of the parking garage and point it at, at a point, and it, so it just didn't operate. Um, anyone here try to operate your cell phone down here after Katrina? Didn't work. Did it work? Some of them worked. I mean, but, but for the most part, you can't count on it. So the satellite phones didn't work, and, and the, you couldn't count on the cell phones. Well, guess what? The payphone worked. The payphone worked. And, and they couldn't believe it. And the other thing is, you know how if you have these phones now that, uh, that are plugged in in your office that have all these different lines? Remember the old-fashioned phones that we had when I was a kid that don't have anything plugged in? Those don't operate on electrical power. And by, by, as luck would have it, or as I was fi finally told that this wasn't luck, but the maintenance department had stocked a bunch of those old rotary phones. And when the, they plugged them in, and they worked. They worked the whole time. Except for one thing. No, they didn't have uh, long distance service. <laughs> Somebody had an AT&T card. And they used this card uh, for four days to operate the uh, evacuation. I will tell you that AT&T uh, the, the guy finally got his phone bill, and he called AT&T and told him, and they said, you don't have to pay. 
we'll, we'll forgive it if we can use that story. Um, <laughs> which they didn't. I'm surprised that they didn't use the story deep in the bowels of the hospital. The cell phones didn't work, but AT&T saved the day. Um, but again, it was all a spirit of innovation. And, it's, and, and then the biggest thing is the decision was made to simply evacuate all the patients there may be 150 patients. In addition to the 150 patients, about 1,500 other people. Anyone here was there? Anyone here in this room? A lot of people who were obviously faculty, staff, uh, people who had gone down to the hospital to protect their research, to stay in their offices and make sure that the thing they're researching, uh, some of them, HCA didn't even know they were there until after the storm. Uh, obviously, the family members of patients, a very large quantity of people, and they had to be taken out one at a time by helicopter. Um, you might think they had planned this in advance. They really didn't. They basically realized this in Nashville and went on the internet and started typing in helicopters. Um, and they started hiring helicopter companies. It is shocking to think that they were able to hire helicopter companies, but they were. There's a guy I talked to who owns a company that owns six Black Hawk helicopters. Those are big army helicopters, obviously. His is a civilian. They carry around 18 people. HCA hired him. He usually, he works for the U.S. government fighting fires usually. He used all his helicopters down here and the federal government never did call him, ever. Uh, HCA used him for days. He sent him the bill, they paid him, but um, uh, the government never did call him to use. So, so you might think this, well, this is all common sense. Well, it didn't happen, um, but it did it at HCA. And at some point I finally, when I did the research for this book, I asked Mr. Bovender, who's the CEO, I said, did it ever occur to you that this was going to cost a lot of money? And he said, yes, it did, but we really felt like this was the right thing to do. I should also point out that HCA doesn't just own one hospital in this market, they own about eight. Uh, I'm not really sure about that number. Some of them are bigger than others, but they um, have a commitment to this market and didn't want to be the, seen as the company that turned tail and ran through this operation. Um, and uh, finally, one other thing I'll tell you, um, also I talk about in the book, and, and, and speaking of ethical things, we get into a lot of issues related to the hospital across the street. Now, many of you are aware that Tulane Hospital is directly across the street from what was then a public, a public hospital called Charity. And in the book, I talk about at great length um, the fact that, that even though Charity's CEO was not at Charity, which is huge, uh, doctors at Charity were acting independently on the behalf of their patients, sending them to Tulane one at a time, sometimes making arrangements by cell phone to have them evacuated. Uh, and then some point, finally on Thursday of that week, they sent about 30 or 40 patients by boat over to Tulane to be evacuated. And some of these patients were in really, really bad shape. There's pictures in the book of some of them laying there while they're being taken care of by Tulane nurses and eventually were evacuated. A lot of courage shown by the charity doctors uh, who didn't have electrical power. Some of them worked for days pumping those hand pumps, keeping people alive. And honestly, at the time, a lot of angry things said back and forth. You may remember that there were accusations that they did not evacuate them fast enough. One of the things that I realized and discovered afterward, though, is that there was a general feeling, a real feeling that if you got patients in the air in those helicopters and away from Tulane, that they would be rescued. Well, a lot of those patients were being taken, a lot of patients at that time were being taken to the airport where, the, where at FEMA had said we're setting up a, a MASH hospital. But the MASH hospital wasn't set up yet. And so a lot of those patients uh, were, were in much better shape, as it turns out, standing next to a doctor and a nurse. It was a great honor to tell this story. There's also a lot of work to tell this story. The other thing I'll mention about it is there's something unique about the New Orleans culture. Granted, we all have a culture of our own, but I'll never forget doing this book. I, I thought I was going to have to interview about 25 people. Turns out I interviewed about 100, and I could have kept going forever. So, but in any case, there's a lot of lessons about ethics and about, uh, about what a company has to do, what kinds of decisions. And one of the things I'll mention is that Tulane is, the hospital obviously is operating. The decision to spend $90 million and rebuild it turns out to have been a good business decision. I was at the hospital yesterday, and they are very, very busy. They're actually adding a pediatric wing. And part of the reason they're busy, of course, is that the city uh, has lost so many of the other hospitals. They're taking on a lot of patients that they didn't used to take on. So thank you very much.
Thank you, Bill. And now, Mr. Stewart, you're up next. Thank you very much. I might say, Bill, that uh, it's a pleasure following you and Holly. You did a magnificent job of explaining the, uh, the aspects of ethics and the application of uh, our subject today, critical moments in ethics. But, Bill, following you is, is a natural procedure. Health care, I'm the next step, death care. <laughs> and uh, be honest, I didn't think of that until you got up here and, and uh, started speaking, and I said, uh, I don't know who arranged this, but nevertheless, uh, it's hard to believe uh, 49 years ago since I joined our family, small family business, and uh, it's been 51 years that I graduated from the Freeman School of, it wasn't the Freeman School of Business, it was the Tulane Business School up on Norman Mayer in the front of the campus and got my degree here, so I'm very indebted to this, this wonderful institution and Dean, I, I can tell you it's a pleasure uh, to be here today. And, and uh, uh, since graduating from business school, I must say I owe a great debt to this wonderful institution that all of you all are beneficiaries of, as I am. I truly appreciate the invitation to be on this Birkin Road program this morning, and especially with a group of outstanding panelists as we have. Uh, I feel like an amateur playing in the big leagues. But I was motivated because of Dr. Cardinal's, uh, let me put it this way, assignment to spend a lot of time in the last couple of days pondering the critical moments that I've endured in my 49 years of business. And I hate to say it, but uh, there are too many to enumerate. And I'm anxious to share just a couple of insights and I want you to understand I'm not trying to impress any of you in any way, but share a couple of these insights as some thoughts that I've learned from the many great mentors and resources I'm privileged to have had in my life. I'll ask a question right now. How many of you in this room chose your mother and father? That's a real lesson of fate how many of you chose the year in which you were ordained to exist? How many of you chose your role models, your opportunities? How many of you chose your gender? How many of you chose your race? How many chose your creed, your health, and hundreds of other gifts that we've all been given in life? And there are no two people alike. All of us are different, and each one of us have a different set of gifts. The greatest gift, however, and I encourage you to meditate on this sometime, the greatest gift in existence is the gift of free will. The gift of free will is something that we all have. Only you and I are in control of our attitude, our decision-making, our self-discipline, our self-confidence, our self-esteem, and certainly our judgment in actions, and that includes ethical actions. You have that choice to make. So much for the ba my basic philosophy in life. Now, what does all this have to do with the subject today? Critical moments in leadership changing the rules of the game. I contend every moment in decision making and every judgment is a critical moment in leadership. We all must use our free will and our learned wisdom to conclude the right answer. We must discipline and this is very important, we must discipline our desires, our appetites, and our passions in life. I tell kids all the time, the one word that will lead to all success and to all happiness in life is the word discipline. I'm gonna define it in a way that you may or may not have heard before, but I define discipline as the ability to make yourself do what you have to do and should do before what you want to do. If you think about it, all of us do what we want to do most of the time. But when you can make yourself do the hard things, study before you come to class, practice before you get out on the field, work before you play, uh, earn before you spend. If you can discipline yourself in life, 
especially in choosing between the temptations of life which are presented to each one of us every day, I will tell you, each one of you will be successful and happy if you can practice that one word that leads to all success and all happiness. Uh, it's vitally important in the seriousness of leadership as an example to give to those that follow you. I could spend hours sharing the hundreds of valuable truths that I've learned about life and business in the business world that I've experienced. But I am going to be sure to abide by Dr. Cardinal's uh, instructions and limit this presentation to no more than 15 minutes. And I see the hook coming up. Uh, <laughs> I'll speak as fast as I can in conclusion, but I, I won't get one fraction of the way through what I'd really love to share with you. And we can save that for another day or personally. And I may even offer at this point the fact that not being able to conclude a lot of thoughts that I will leave dangling uh, I'm going to perfect this because of the assignment. Uh, it's made me outline the critical moments in my life to the point where I'm going to perfect it, have it typed in a more readable copy. And anybody who would like one, I'll be more than happy to send it to you. All you have to do is give Dr. Cardinal or, or myself a card and an address, and I'll be happy when I get this thing perfected because I'm now going to enumerate as fast as I can uh, some of the critical moments of my life. Number one, choosing my vocation. Number two, the critical decision of a very important part of my life, and that was choosing an industrial psychologist in helping me choose my staff, my executives. Uh, a professional who is steeped in the training of understanding the nature of people is such an important decision to make because turnover the cost of turnover, the cost of training, hiring, training, and motivating, and spending time in a company only a year or two later to go elsewhere is such an unbelievable cost and waste. An industrial psychologist who I had for 27 years taught me how to put round pegs in round holes and square ones in square ones. And I can tell you, we built a little 15-man family business to 8,500 employees. We built a little firm that was doing a quarter of a million dollars a year, $250,000 a year, to a firm that at our peak did $870 million as a public company. And it's a long story. As I say, I'm going to put it in writing so that you, I can have the uh, continuity of, of your understanding of how all this happened. The other critical uh, point uh, decision was consolidating eight family businesses or entities into one holding company in 1970. Committing to grow the business outside of New Orleans was another critical point. Uh, a critical decision was building the first crematory in Louisiana, much against the trend of people in death care, but we have focused always on trying to give people what they want, not what we want. And our desire is to give them all the options and alternatives available. So we took the, in 1972, there was not a crematory in the state of Louisiana. We built the first crematory m with much opposition. Uh, the decision to build the first combination cemetery and funeral home uh, in, in one location, giving people the efficiencies, the economies, the conveniences of, of having all services at a, at, a, at a lower cost and a greater efficiency and, 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 and an ease. The leadership decision to acquire uh, other family businesses as a means of growing our business. Uh, that was a major critical decision uh, in the leadership. The decision to take on stonework where we diversified our activities, uh, which I think was a wise move, and, uh, and did many buildings such as the Shell Building, the uh, Pan American Life Building, the Hilton Hotel. I could name 20 or 30 buildings that our little firm grew into as a contracting development and building firm. I often kid people, tell them I'm in live real estate and dead real estate. And the live is dead, and the dead is alive. Uh, the, leader decision, uh, the leadership decision uh, to take, uh, take on and build an office building in 1971, followed by a second high-rise 20-story building in 1982. Now we have uh, uh, not the company, not Stewart Enterprises, but Stewart Capital, which was a diversification of my estate. Uh, many hotels and properties around the country. I've got one minute, she says. Uh, <laughs> As I say, I won't touch surface, but the major critical decision in going public was the change of my life. And I can 
I can attest to the fact that I know what some people physically have to go through in a change of life. Believe me, going from private to public, from a 1910 company, which we were, uh, to a public company in 1991 was a critical decision. The decision to have two classes of stock, which I could tell you the story of the values that were benefited there. The decision to go international, and then the decision to come back to the domestic market and sell everything we had outside of the continental United States except Puerto Rico where we have 49% of the market share. Uh, those all were critical decisions and I can tell you they changed the rules of the game in many ways and as I say I will hope to elaborate and respond to some of your questions but let me end on, on one or two notes. One, hiring a successor as protection of my family, my stockholders, my employees was a vitally important thing. I hired a man 30 years younger than I am, an MBA, who has been with me now 12 years, and it was the most critical decision I made and the best decision I made because if I'm called today and leave this world today, I have somebody that will take over the responsibilities. That was a very critical decision. Uh, the decisions to hire, as I say, an estate manager and a, and a financial manager, I'm going to end on this one note. The word ego is the driving force of most people in life. And I'm going to leave you with the definition, and I've told this to many people in the last number of years since I learned it from somebody who told it to me and impressed me. Ego is E-G-O. When you ease God out. Now, it doesn't matter what you believe in or who you believe in or what faith you practice, but when you become God, and you know all the answers and you don't have to rely on anybody else, you have an ego problem. Wisdom is what you're here in school to learn. And I contend one of the real points to think about, ego is the cause of wars, egos are the cause of divorces, egos are the cause of failure in business, egos are something that you need to concentrate on and be honest and open enough to know that we don't have all the answers and that these other people in life, the professionals that teach you daily, are very important. I wish I could go on because there's much more that I wrote, but uh, I thank you very much and I thank Dr. Dr. Laura very much. Mr. Mock, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. You can't see me very well because I'm standing behind a podium, but I can tell you that as a follically, chronologically, and vertically challenged American by choice, <laughs> which means I'm a short, bald immigrant, and I was worried about this thing in front of me because all you see is a reflection off the top of my head with all these lights coming to me, so I hope my um, follically challenged condition did not blind you uh, with all these lights. But the, the seminar today is about critical moments in leadership and changing rules of the game. I've been married almost 40 years to the same woman, Nancy, and I will tell you that in 40 years of marriage, you keep the marriage together. Every day is a critical moment in leadership. <laughs> and the rules of the game kept changing, especially if my wife wants to prove a point. Um, however, I will say that I want to thank Professor Cardinal for giving me such a great uh, introduction and especially talking about my 200 years of life compressed into very short. My mother always worries. She says, Sam, when people see your resume and your bio, they think that you cannot hold a job. Um, I have done many different things. The problem is I told mom, you have fed me too much sugar because I have attention deficit. I just can't stay in one place too long, too active. But um, I'm really very glad to be here today because I will be the first to admit to you you don't know this, though, here you hear first from me today. Most of my academic life, I've been a gentleman C student. If I got a C, I'm happy. If I got a B minus, I go take all my friends out to celebrate. <laughs> so my, my grades have never been good enough to come to a university like Tulane. And yet, today, I got a chance to stand here before you to speak to you in front of deans, you know, great sponsors, you know, great academics, and all these bright students who got into Tulane. I really think America is a beautiful country because. Uh, <laughs> How, how, what other country can you do that? Um, for those of you who are getting C's, don't worry, look at me. There's a great future ahead of you. 
Steve Job, then quite finished college, but don't quit. As I told you earlier, my, I've been married a long time, and I believe that my wife, I really believe that is the smartest woman with great judgment. The reason I say that is because of all the guys out there, she picked me as her husband. Great judgment, great wisdom. <laughs> so I told her last night, we flew up last night, and before you know, I came out, I told her, I said, Nancy, I'm going to be making a speech to a great audience, and I want to make sure I do a good job, so I want her to read my speech, and she's very smart. And, uh, so after she read it, she gave me the same advice she'd been giving me every day for the last 40 years. She said, Sam, take out the garbage. So <laughs> today I'm going to talk to you from heart instead of from a prepressed script. For those of you who study liberal arts, you probably remember what Shakespeare wrote once. Some are born great. Others have achieved greatness. Still others have greatness thrust upon them. In our daily life, all of us try to achieve greatness. All of us try to be great fathers, great mother, great employees, great professors, great deans, great friends, and so forth and so on. And yet, in our pursuit of greatness, we have always been faced with a lot of challenges. Every moment in our life is a critical moment, and the rule of the game has always, rules of the game have always been changing. I believe there are two types of leaders. Because when we talk about critical moments in leadership, let's talk about what is leadership. I believe there are two leaders. One is appointed leader, the other is elected leaders. I had served in appointed leadership position many times. When President Bush appoint, nominated me as CFO US Department of Labor, 100 senators agreed that I'm the right guy for the job. I showed up at Labor Department one day and said, I'm your financial leader. There was no vote in the Labor Department that said, do you want Sam Mark? I just showed up, took over an office of 150 accountants and IT type, and said, from this day on, I'm your leader. There are elected leaders, like Bill was talking about in his little session in the cafeteria, those who run for office. Now, those are two very different types of leaders. An appointed leader uh, assumed power because it was given to him. An elected leader has to get power from people who want to give it to him. I also submit to you that there's a third kind of leader, which every one of you can be. It's leader by reference, meaning you're very good at what you do, and people come to you because they want to, not because they have to. My staff at Labor Department, when I was Comptroller of U.S. Treasury under Bush 41, when I was a State Department under Reagan, I was an appointed leader. People came to me because they had to. They had no choice. I, I had the presidential seal. I had a senator who, co who confirmed that I am the guy. So when I say something, they had to do it because my authority is statutorily based. If you're an elected leader, you got the votes. You got to reflect the will of the people. So you're not really your own person in many ways, although some politicians are very moral courage. They stood up for their beliefs. And sometimes they have to pay the price for it. But a leader, by reference, is somebody who is very good at what they do. People will want to come to them because they want to get the right answer, because they know the leader, by reference, will help them solve the problem. Every one of you can be a leader by reference. Not all of you want to be an elected leader. It's hard. Raise money. It's not easy. And all appointed leader. I remember when I was growing up in Hong Kong, under British rule, and I'm probably one of the few people in this room who have actually lived under colonial rule. I always remember the British were great colonial administrators because they really created a great government. There's clearly, and they are in charge. They were in charge, there's no question. And yet there was a sense of cooperation because the British colonial secretary operate on a simple premise. They always remind the civil servants that those who govern can only govern effectively with the consent of the governed. If you do not have the consent of the governed, dictatorship will never last. Look at history, how many dictatorships lasted. And yet, democracy always lasted. If you work with the people, a great leader is one who work with the people, who seek out consensus. But that doesn't mean you take a vote. President George W. Bush always reminded those of us who served in his administration the story that when he was running for office, he was in a certain town in the United States, and the mayor hosted an event for him and took him to a parade. 
And they saw all these people going by. The mayor proudly pointed out that these are my constituents. These are my people. I go wherever they go. President Bush told us he never invited that gentleman to serve in his administration because that person is a follower. That person not, is not a leader. As he jokingly told us, he said, if you're in charge and the people don't like you and they try to run you out of town, get in front of the parade so it looks like you're leading the parade. Okay, so uh, the important thing is you have to really understand what you want to be. You have to have goals, you have to have visions, and you have to share those visions with those who you're responsible for. That way you can seek the consent of the governed. Admiral Ted Allen, most of you probably know, commander of the U.S. Coast Guards, he was sent down here after Director Brown from FEMA so was relieved of his duty after Katrina uh, hit uh, this area and FEMA's reaction was not the best. I happen to know Emma Thad Allen quite well. So after he came back, a few of us had lunch with him. And I said, Thad, tell us what you did that was so different that Director Brown was not able to accomplish. He made a very interesting observation that I want to share with you here. And they talked about it a lot. And it talks about being able to diagnose a problem correctly as a leader on a timely basis. This is what he said. He said, FEMA looked at Katrina as a natural disaster which many people would have done the same. Because the Coast Guard, because my point to him is Coast Guards and FEMA have the same playbook. Why are you guys achieving great results, or at least some eyes? FEMA took a black eye. He said, because FEMA treated Katrina as a natural disaster. He said, Coast Guard correctly came to a conclusion very early that this is not a natural disaster. This is a weapon of a mass destruction without criminality. They treated this as a weapon of mass destruction that hit this area. So they took out a different playbook. As a result, it was a lot more effective. So being a leader, you have to know how to diagnose the problem and identify problems correctly and use the right playbook. So the critical moment in leadership at that point in time is identify your problem correctly. The other critical moment in leadership, which is very important, is we do mess up. All of us mess up. I always believe that if you don't mess up, you haven't done anything. All right? I lived in Washington, D.C. for almost 40 years. One thing I learned a long time ago is if you messed up, fess up. Don't try to cover it up. If you read all the national scandals, you'll be shocked to find out many famous people, high and mighty, went to jail not for the original sin they committed, it's for the cover-up afterwards. This is especially true in Washington, D.C. Many great politi politicals, many great national leaders got in deep trouble, not because of what they did, it was because of what they did after what they did. Uh, I came to this country when I was a young man, and one thing that impressed me very much is America is a very forgiving society. If you messed up, my past experience is that if you stood up and say, I'm really sorry, I did this, admit it, make amends, and move on, you'll be given a second chance in this country. Not so in Asia, not so in many other countries, but America is a very forgiving, very, very forgiving country. So for those of you who aspire to be leaders, a critical moment would be when you find out you messed up, how do you deal with it? When you try to cover it up, when you start telling lies to cover it up, you're gonna dig yourself deeper in the hole. You may suffer great embarrassment. You may have some discomfort. But I think if you stood up and say, yes, I messed up. I ask for your forgiveness. This is what I'm going to do to fix it and move on. And you'll be surprised that you know, pretty soon, it's another day, another dollar. I also want to say that communication always is a critical moment in leadership. I talk about this frequently, about if there are only two of us in a room talking to each other, there are really six of us talking to each other. Because there are the me that you see physically, the me that I want you to see, and the me that really me, that I might not even know, and then there are three of you. So if you think about the communication between those six entities, it gets very convoluted. But if you understand that and keep that in mind, how to filter through all those other irrelevant packaging, 
I think you'll get to a good critical moment to make good decisions. The other thing very important is know thyself very well. Secretary Yelena El Chao, my former boss, always talked about this. You talk about Enron, WorldCom, so forth and so on. I've been in financial management all, all my life. And Secretary Chao, my old boss, was a Harvard MBA. And we talked about this, this thing that she observed, that when we were going through business school we were in the 60s, we were taught a key responsibility of financial manager is to smooth our earnings. Don't allow your company's earnings to go like yo-yo up and down. Okay? The trouble is, as we go along, the paradigm shifted. Okay? Things changed, value changed, and yet many people did not change with times. Case in point, in the public, in the public sector, Woolworth, Pan American Airways, Wang Computer, they all did not change with time, and therefore, they are no longer here, and yet the industry they represent are doing gangbusters. Brand of airline, for example. So as a critical moment in leadership, you need to understand your environment and be able to adapt to your environment very quickly. Lord Acton wrote this famous phrase many years ago, 100 years ago almost. A nation has neither permanent friends or permanent enemies, only permanent interests. If you serve as a leader, you also need to remember that, although most of you will not be leading nations, you have to understand the core interests of the group that you represent. Your own personal feelings, your personal position, your personal bias, totally irrelevant. A good leader is one who understood very clearly and be able to commit to the core needs, value, and requirement of the group that you are accountable for. Last but not least, if you have not read this book, I suggest that you should. It's a very old book that was required reading when I was going through B school. It's a book called The Pyramid Climbers, written by this author called Vance Packett. In the first opening page, he wrote this phrase, those who got to the top will never tell you how they really got there. Okay. I've been pondering that all my life. I say, why? I think one of the reasons is they might have forgotten in the long struggle and the battles. Okay. The others frequently, those who got to the top, really did not have a map like you think they would have. It's all basically seizing the moment and make good decisions. So in that critical moment, what you do, how you decide, impacts the rest of your life. And in closing, I want one more time to express my gratitude to the Birken Road Institute, to Tulane University, to the wonderful sponsor here in front of us, and also to uh, Professor Laura Cardinal uh, and all the deans giving me this opportunity. Never in my dreams, I'm able to come here, a great university in this nation, an average C student who barely got through my college degree and my graduate school by the skin of my teeth to have the chance to share my thoughts with you. Thank you very much. I just so much want to thank Holly, Bill, Frank, and Sam for just sharing the wealth of knowledge, experience with you, providing this kaleidoscope over critical moments in leadership with you. And I really want to thank you as an audience for just being a delightful audience and being here today um, because we would not be successful either without you. For more information on the A.B. Freeman School of Business, or to request a DVD copy of this program, please visit www.researchchannel.tulane.edu or call 1-877-333-TULANE.